Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's In the Artist Studio. I'm Elena Gross. I'm the Curatorial Manager of Exhibitions and the Emerging Artist Program here at MOAD. And it's my pleasure today to be speaking and touring in virtual space with Oakland-based photographer Dion Lee. Before we get started, as I mentioned, um, to those of you just joining, um, please uh, drop in the chat where you were joining us from today, either on Zoom or on Facebook. Um, MOAD's physical building may be closed due to the mandatory shelter in place, but you can still get your fill of art and artists of the African diaspora. Each Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard, join MOAD staff members like myself as we visit with some of our favorite artists in their studios to see what they're working on and how their work is changing as a result of quarantine. This is a rare opportunity to hear from artists directly from their studios. We will follow all talks with an audience Q&A, so please feel free to leave your questions in either the chat box or the Q&A box. Or if you're on Facebook, um, leave them in the chat and they will be dropped into the Q&A box at a later um, time. So you can, you can leave questions throughout any point during, um, during the talk today. And please visit our website to see which artists we have coming up. You can also go back and watch all of our previous talks on the MOAD YouTube channel. This series was made possible by generous donations from the Westridge Foundation, our wonderful MOAD members, and viewers like you. Thank you all for your continued support. MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, Breonna Taylor, and so many others who have lost their lives at the hands of police brutality and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. We'd also like to give a land acknowledgement. Most of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent. Our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples whose land we are located. With deep respect, MOAD acknowledges that even in virtual space, our people, our work, and our network servers are on the native lands, are on native lands, and we thank the indigenous people of the Bay Area who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Lastly, if you've been enjoying this series or any MOAD programming, please consider donating to MOAD online. Donations of any amount are always welcome. The link to where you can donate will also be left in the chat. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to today's featured artist, Dion Lee. Dion Lee is a visual artist working in photography, collage, and video to explore ideas of power and agency in relation to the American landscape. Lee received her MFA from California College of the Arts in 2017. She has exhibited work at the Museum of Modern Art, Aperture Foundation, the School of the International Center of Photography in New York City, and throughout the Bay Area, including Aggregate Space, Interface Gallery, and the San Francisco Arts Commission. Lee was a 2019 artist in resident at the Center for photography at Woodstock and a finalist for the 2019 SF MoMA SICA and, at, and San Francisco Artadia Awards. Lee currently teaches at Stanford University. Lee lives and works on the unceded territories of the Ohlone and the Chechenyo peoples. So welcome. Thanks for having me, Elena. Yeah, thanks for being here today. <laughs> yeah. How are you doing? I'm okay. Um... I'm okay. Like I said, I have some hot water here. It's a little chilly in the Bay today. And um, as I also mentioned to you earlier, I did my hair today. So that feels like I'm doing all right. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's great. So I'm excited. Um, I'm excited to kick this off. Um, so it looks like, are you, it looks like you're potentially in your, your home, your home, but also your home studio right now. Mm -hmm. um, do you work, is this kind of your setup during, has this been your setup during the pandemic? Um, partially, this is like, I call it my classroom because <laughs> so I teach, right? And so this is where I, um, teach from, but I have a studio space, um, in Oakland, but it's funny that you mentioned that just like, where am I working? Because I'm kind of spread out. I lost darkroom access at the beginning of COVID. Um, like so many people lost access to different spaces and I, briefly or momentarily I've been working at the darkroom Minnesota street project so I've been going to San Francisco then back to Oakland my studio is kind of up near Berkeley and then sometimes I work here but I just actually I'm moving into a new studio space where I can build out my own darkroom so it's kind of like a really huge deal and I'm really looking forward to it and not have where's the studio space it's in Oakland it's just in some guy's basement <laughs> to be honest but you know it's like I have I have all the things I need there to to, yeah. to have a, a a dark room. Um so I'm really excited about that. And that, that happens this weekend. <laughs> oh, congratulations. Yeah. After a year, you've like you're finally kind of getting back to some sense, at least within your practice, it seems like some sense of normalcy. 
Yeah. How have you yeah. like kind of managed during shelter in place in terms of, I mean, obviously losing darkroom access, but like, what have you been able to do in the meantime, I guess, in terms of, in terms of your work? Yeah, I have just kind of like gave myself a break for a while because I think we all needed to give ourselves a break, right? Um, and, and just like process what was happening or what is happening. But um, I, you know, started to just kind of dive more into research when I was losing access, when I didn't have access to a space to make in. And um, for me, that really has just been like, taking lots of walks, which is something I always do, but I've recently been making pictures in my neighborhood and that's been really great. Um, and just doing a lot of reading and thinking, although now I'm kind of have, um, I've been making a lot of work in my neighborhood, actually. It's funny, I actually recently just made a video in this like weird, like green space in between all these houses. It's kind of like a roundabout, but I was in there with these like mirrors by myself. And then like these people were coming to like mow the lawn over there and all these people were just staring. <laughs> but I just like, this is, I'm staying close to home these days. And so I'm just using the my closest landscape, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of, um, I feel like, and we'll get into this as we start looking at your work, but in thinking about parks in Oakland, I feel like there's a lot of very interesting and rich degrees of kind of green space within within Oakland specifically so I'm sure that gives you a lot to kind of work with and a lot to think about yeah I mean I live um close I almost said we live for people oh I know I live in the same neighborhood <laughs> <laughs> but there's um Sossel Creek which is like you can take the bus up there like five minutes and there's and that also leads to um I think eventually it ends up in Joaquin Miller Regional Park so there's just like it's nice to be this close to a, a larger regional um, park. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, how has, in terms of like showing your work um, as a you know practicing art, a professor or teacher, but also a practicing artist, um, how has, have you any shows been interrupted? Have any um, exhibition opportunities shifted for you in this period of time? Yeah, um, I would say there are probably two main ones, which one was uh, I'm in a new photography show at the New Orleans Museum of Art, which that was also have which hey Brian is here, but that was also um, that was delayed due to COVID, but that was actually a really smooth transition into just like we're just delaying it and then the work is up and now the exhibition's extended. So that's really great. Oh, excellent. They have visitors, visitors are allowed to, to come in, you know, masked and, you know, to see the, see the exhibition safely. Um, and then probably the biggest disruption was for the MoMA show, um, that new photography show, because, you know, they had to put it online, right? That was happening when um, the show was being organized right at the beginning of the pandemic. So it was a lot of unknowns, but that was disappointing, of course, but it also, um, you know, what are you gonna do? <laughs> like right. yeah. everything's messed up. So it was just yeah. like, this is what it is and that's fine. And I'm just really grateful to, um, have my work be shown like through through moments organization. Now that um, museums in New York are open again, is the work still up, or did it have to did it have to come down? It it only existed online, and I don't mm. know what the plans are for it being yeah. in person at this moment in time. Well, I feel like that's a good segue into starting um, kind of starting to really look at your work in a. Um, more granular level. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen really quickly. I want to begin, I want to start off by um, talking about your most recent local exhibition um, that just uh, closed recently at Cube Space in Berkeley, Touch and Go. So the themes of this exhibition um, were speci specifically around survival, danger, and the importance of touch um, are incredibly prescient for you know the current time and the current kind of environment that we all find ourselves in sort of grappling a year out from COVID. Um, how did this exhibition in particular um, come together? Was this initially um, planned as kind of response to the pandemic or was the kind of these relevant or were these relevant themes something you were already working with that just kind of happened to align um, at this period? Yeah, I mean, the themes of like survival and stuff I had been working on for about a year, which I always, always want to mention too, that 
I was working on it prior to like the moment that we all find ourselves in, which was a really like just a strange um, moment for me in terms of thinking about like literally how to survive. Um, but um, the show, the like theme for the show was conceived by Layla Weaver. Um, did I say your last name correctly? Weaver? Um, I believe you can pronounce it either Weaver or Weefway. Oh, Weefway, yeah, okay. I'll try to say Layla Weefway. Um, so they, oh, yeah, they kind of conceived this idea around um, the concept of touch. And I believe, I was trying to remember, I believe we talked about this before COVID actually happened. And I also say, want to say that we were both pretty much on the same page of like not wanting this to be a direct response to the moment that we're in just because there's a lot of pressure to do that. And it's also just like, we should all just be allowed to like process, right? Um, not necessarily like speak to, um, what's happening right now, they're all grappling with. Um, but it was interesting when, you know, they brought up this theme of touch. I, at first was like, oh, I don't know how this, like, how I can like do this. Like I was like, which is so funny because my hand is in a lot of my work. So there's this implication of touch. Um, but I was more so thinking about um, at this moment in time, I was, you know, looking at these survival skills. And one of the skills I was really focusing on was like how to make fire from scratch, just kind of like understanding it to be this like life sustaining source, right? It gives us like um, warmth and light and you can cook your food on it, right? Again, just like, um, and so in some of the images, which is kind of like, my, my screen's a little small right now, but it's hard to see, but there's um, actions of people rubbing, like making fire, which I took a fire making class. Um, and to do it with like a bow and drill, you usually need a partner and it's two people, like one on top of the other rubbing their hands like this. So I was thinking about that as like this touch or this this movement that like brings a, a part, that brings up this like spark, this like life um, source. Um, but, but also, you know, this installation talking about things being solved because of COVID was stalled not because of COVID, but because of the fires and the air mm -hmm. being really bad here, um, which was just another, you know, I even was like, is this the right thing to be putting up? And I, it's really illegible. Like it's not clear exactly what you're looking at all the time, but I was, um, yeah, I was just thinking about a lot of the duality of, of the elements basically, which is something I also think about, which is like, you know, wildfire is this, um, is this, feeder of life it also destroys right and something that we also are really familiar with in California as being a symbol of like danger right right um even though there are practices also of like doing controlled fires on the land right, right? that helps right. like replenish the earth and fertilizes the soil and brings new life right and, like, so controlled it's fires as a means of control fires as a means of saving us from these uncontrolled wildfires is like a mm -hmm. measure even. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just always interested in those sorts of like spaces. And that's kind of, I think, at the root a lot of, in, of my research around like survival skills. Yeah. It's interesting to hear you talk about the fires and thinking about, you know, not wanting to make something that was a direct response to the pandemic and just thinking about how we here in the Bay Area, because it, it's weird to, you know, maybe it's because of all the rain we've gotten recently, but I haven't been as present, presently thinking about fire season. But, you know, over the past year, we've had so many compounding kind of crises. And yeah. then obviously not even the social, cult, the sociocultural kind of crises of, you know, the past summer or the election or the insurrection, um, you know, oh. all of these like very compounding um, experiences that we all are kind of grappling with and trying to make work under like it seems like yeah it's like a it's a lot of pressure for an artist to kind of to have to be ta either tasked with responding or feel like I'm sort of like did you feel that I guess um it, outside of this exhibition like that there was a desire for that people had a desire for you to kind of use your work to speak to those issues I don't I didn't feel that but I don't know if it's because I made that decision for myself in advance or I was like I'm not doing that like this is yeah too much and just all the things you listed and not to like you know go too off topic or jump ahead but it's just um like we've really been traumatized right yeah. for a long period of time just like collectively and just um yeah no I don't feel that pressure because I don't think that would be healthy <laughs> good for you for like just nope there are people who can do that and I like applaud 
you yeah. know, go for it. But yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> So uh, making the use of the window in cube space kind of ensured that your work, you know, at this time that there's limited access to public space in a specific way because of um, quarant because of sheltering place and because of um, social distancing, uh, making use of this window really ensured that there was still going to be an accessibility and a visibility to your work at this time period. Um, had you adapted your work in this sort of kind of site specific way prior to this exhibition? And how was the experience, if, if, um, if so, how was the experience different from the way you've um, previously installed or thought of your work in terms of an installation-based model? Yeah, I never had, so my work is often really quite small. Um, like it doesn't really exceed 20 by 24 inches most often, unless it's like a video being projected. Um, so this was also, it was like a, it was a welcome challenge for me to to think about how to to work larger. Um, and you asked also about um, being site specific, and like the my relationship to that. I also don't have much relationship to that. Where I feel like my work is actually tends to be pretty placeless. Like there's not it's not it's about the American landscape or America, but it's not. I'm rarely focusing on like a specific. Um, plot of like land or place, you know, because um, I also just believe that it's all, I don't know, the things I'm interested in exist like in every inch of this <laughs> land, you know. Um, yeah, but I think there's the scale was the biggest thing for me to like kind of wrap my head around, just like how did this work? Um, but it was, a, it was a welcome challenge. <laughs> How did you produce it? I mean, just thinking about, again, like thinking about the scale and thinking about kind of limited access to some of the same resources you would have mm -hmm. had previous to the pandemic, like how did you produce this work? Yeah, I did start off small. So I was doing like, like on my, like this is actually here and like my tabletop, just trying to um, put together compositions. And then I got them printed, um, shout out to Piedmont Copy. I got them printed really large. But then when I was in the space, I did other things. Like I added graphite to the surface, which is mm -hmm. something I do to my silver gelatin prints. And I made, I did do some, you know, collaging of like, in the moment, like actually in the cube, just kind of um, putting things together. But it's funny, I started off small. Like I, I think that it's hard for me to, um, I don't know, something that I often go back to when I'm thinking about making my work or processing or researching is um, the, the scale, just thinking about like how massive the actual land we're all on is, mm -hmm. I like to try and just like make it feel like I can grasp that, you know? So, so I think that's why I tend to to go smaller. Um, and yeah, I'm just interested also in just like being closer to like the ground, if that makes sense. Yeah, or the ground, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, with that. <laughs> Um, so your work is, um, you know, as we're talking, uh, talking about has largely explored like the complexities of the American landscape, um, especially in its relationship to American history and systems of power. And you're originally from New York, New York City, right? And so just thinking about, you know, your, you know, how you now relocated to the Bay Area, did a lot of this interest, a lot of this work, this exploration begin begin on the East Coast, begin in New York, and then translate to the Bay Area, or did it? was it something that came out of your move here that kind of developed as you became more immersed in the Northern California landscape? Yeah, it was definitely percolating on the East Coast. Like I, I also like to share that, so I'm from Harlem originally and I grew up across the street from the North end of Central Park. So there was always this like very close green space to me growing up, which I think, um, I don't know, like did something in the back of my like brain, I don't know, but, um, yeah, so I think, you know, even though I grew up in New York, I was always really interested in plants, especially in like my adulthood. I was um, practiced like herbalism. I did like foraging, like urban foraging, things like that. So I was always interested, but I never, moving here was a real shift for me in the sense that I realized how often, um, well, I guess I'll just say like moving here, I was, 
it was surprising how much like sky I could see at once, yeah. which is a weird thing to say, but in New York, you know, there's lots of buildings, you're only seeing like slithers of, of the sky. And so that was a real, it made me, I often would just say out loud, like, wow, like I live on a planet. Like I felt that for real being out here. Cause it was just like a horizon line, a sky, right. like, things that I don't, I wasn't used to like seeing. And I think that also made me feel smaller in like a good way. And just, um, it made me really, it like was a, it forced me to reorient myself um, in terms of like how I related to, to the land in general. Um, yeah. Interesting that like some of your, your approach to landscape here was really like affected by the sky as opposed to like the idea that like it wasn't like necessarily I mean and I'm, I'm sure like to a certain extent seeing like the redwoods and stuff also like coming to or you know various things for myself even coming from the east coast thinking about the things that like experiencing for the first time on the west coast but it, it's interesting to hear you talk about the sky as a means of like opening up and expanding your perspective about the land about the ground um mm -hmm. really really fascinating yeah, I was also definitely looking down a lot because there's also so many great plants here. I was just like, I was like, oh my God, I have to learn all these like names of all these plants and even seeing like owl plants that are bigger than you or just like, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's a real like humbling experience, I, I would say. Yeah, like talk about playing with scale. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so the, the themes of this most recent exhibition um, are facets that, you know, you touch on, as you're saying, you touch on, you've been touching on in your work for a long time. Um, you know, specifically, and that that's something that I'm very interested in. Um, so I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about the relationship between, and we started to talk about it a little bit, but the re relationship between survival and danger in your work, survival as a practice versus danger as like imminent threat and survival in some ways is what comes after danger. Um, so after surviving an event or surviving an attack, um, but survival tactics or techniques also presume that danger is inevitable or at the very least always possible or always present, mm -hmm. um, which I think is really interesting. Um, so not only does it speak to learning to exist or to thrive within a wilderness context, but also to, it feels like it also speaks to like a black American experience writ large, the idea of imminent danger of like a constant environment of threat and how to, how to survive that um, and then you know, the techniques, the tactics we learn to do so. And I was just wondering how those things come into play in your work. Yeah, um, yeah, there are a lot of, okay. Yeah, so I, I think, oh, if I, I'm gonna go part piece by piece. The one, one part that stuck out to me that you said was um, in the wilderness context, which is definitely true, right? Like a lot of the things I make are in what we understand to be wilderness, but in terms of thinking about like threat and danger, Lately, I've been thinking about um, like how how we define wilderness necessarily, which is like, is it the is it a place or is it like who occupies that space or how that space is used, right? Like, it, it feels like a really um, it feels like the Harris is probably a larger definition there, right? That can quantify something as wilderness, which is a space where you you know, is defined as like wild and, and kind of um, unsustainable, right, for you to like thrive in. Um, yeah, and I also just was thinking about when I was making some of the, some work in the early um, days of the pandemic, and you mentioned earlier the protests that were happening, and you know, I used to live in a neighborhood that was much closer to where the hub of that activity was happening. And it was just a really, um, I don't know, it's, it's, I can't even put words to it, but just to be like making this work, thinking about survival, the early days of the pandemic. And there's like, I'm hearing like protests out my window, you know, it's just, or like I was able to walk to one that was just like a couple blocks from my house, you know what I mean? Just really, um, I don't even, I don't have the words. Sometimes just saying that that was kind of like the environment that I was making in and it definitely shows up in the work. Um, and then just in particular, I also think about like who is best positioned to survive. So thinking about like we mentioned those tactics or like um, my own experiences as like a black person in this world, it's just like I came to the realization that like 
or not, it's not, I guess I knew this already, but I just was really sitting in the, in remembering that um, I'm not in the best position to survive and that's on purpose, right? Like there's, there's forces that are um, determining who, who can like survive or who has to make that choice every day, right? Um, and yeah, I feel like I maybe missed parts of your question, but no, it, no, I, I think, think I just I think about all this. Yeah, I'm I'm also interested in thinking about that, like who, thinking about who is safe in certain spaces. Like I think mm -hmm. you know one of the things that's interesting about the wilderness conversation is the idea of like this kind of wild uninhabited land where the idea is that the threat, if there is one, is from is from the earth itself. Is from right, which is that's where is from mudslides is from earthquake is mm -hmm. from flood whereas when you are a person of color and specifically a black person in these spaces often the threat is from other people encountering you in the wild and so you're mm -hmm. contending with both of these two dynamics at the same time and so it really does bring into question what wilderness wilderness is whether or not it is as you were saying whether it is a place or whether it is who you're sharing the space with who you're sharing the space with or an experience mm -hmm. Um, yeah 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 and it definitely also it all comes from my own experiences of like being in those places and feeling like oh like why you know wanting a certain sense of like comfort because I go to wilderness spaces for comfort right for mm -hmm. kind of like a refuge but then there's always this like lingering um fear that exists there which is historical right and that's also you can talk about like ancestral trauma and stuff and that whole well, that lineage that goes down that way but or even very recent uh, situations oh. like with um, Christian Cooper in Central Park, um, just trying to watch some birds and, yeah. then, you know, and then next thing you know, like somebody's trying to call police on it. And yeah. thinking about those things simultaneously and kind of like how that relationship to anti-Black racism and white supremacy as being built into the way, just being built into the landscape itself. Mm -hmm. and that's how we experience it as as people i mean even in like so a lot of the um images that i work with are found i take the images but i also use a lot of found imagery and i usually go through like scour through these wilderness survival guides that are all written by these like white dudes who do this for fun and i just think it's funny who like try and like survive right <laughs> like in the, and i just you know it's um it's just again interesting to be like okay well who is doing this like who is this a sport for right and then who right. is this just like um a non-choice right that you just have to right. do everything oh, that's actually not yeah so this is a still from um one of your videos uh challenger deep which um you use these uh divining rods which are historically have been used to locate water correct mm -hmm. like that's mm -hmm. um so just thinking about what are some other um what are some other survival techniques that you've uh, learned recently that you've been employing in the work that you've been making yeah well yeah so this is um it's used for like it's, it has been used to find groundwater mm -hmm. but it also has is uh, used sometimes as like a spiritual like divination tool of just like you can program them to like ask it questions and it can respond to you but board you kind of like a wish one, yes. <laughs> Level we G. Um, so, but yeah, so other skills. Oh yeah, so I mentioned like the fire making, which is like was really um powerful for me because it's a lot of work. It's really hard, and then it, you get a spark and you get a little flame, and then it goes away literally like in a second if you don't act fast enough. And just thinking about that like labor that goes into just like um trying to get that and also thinking about, I often am interested in like when I'm studying these skills that these were things that um, used to be more common, right? Obviously we have technology, right? That like frees us, right? From having to um, rely on these sorts of um, what might seem like archaic like skills, but I, in the back of my mind, I'm always like, I don't know, we might need to like return to these. Right. Or these. Um, another skill that was, uh, I was really, impacted by was learning how to map the sky with your hands so you can learn like different ways to hold your hands that can measure degrees in the sky um which is 
prominent in the like north two north pieces um but that in particular like so i don't know if those are in the slide or not they um, are. i think they're yeah they're the okay. next we can talk yeah. about them now yeah yeah so like um that was really impactful for me um because in thinking about so this is like how you would find a north star basically and like if you were to if you're in the northern hemisphere looking up you would find the big dipper and you'd like put one pinky there and you measure 30 I think it's 15 or 30 degrees 15 15 and then the north star should be over over here and that should like always work so this is how i was taught like it should always work um and that was just really interesting to me to think about like how your body is its own tool to like survive right or just like how we have we can we house um we can house these skills ourselves and especially thinking ancestrally where i when i learned that i did think wow like well the first thing you think of when you think about finding North Star, right, is of course like um, people moving across like the Underground Railroad, right, or moving from the South, migrating from the South to the North, or fleeing, I should say, the South. Um, and I just, this is the more like, um, there's just something really impactful about thinking, wondering if I had someone in my lineage who like had to do this, right, or I literally had to help that same position and something about performing that even just like for a photograph um, felt really like portal space, you know, just kind yeah. of speaking to the past. Um, well, it's interesting to think about the body as a tool in that way, especially in a within photographic practice is like, obviously the camera was this extension of a vision of our field of vision, um, you know, this kind of augmentation to the body to be able to, to see it. And through that, you know, many, many different iterations, the, you know, the camera then becomes digital camera, then becomes iPhones, then becomes all, all, all these other different technologies. But the idea of going back to the body as its own knowledge system in sort of the creation of meaning and of specifically, you know, I think about a lot, you know, you work in, like you're working in the dark room and then also working kind of with the surface of the image itself and cutting and collaging. And so, it seems like a lot of your practice is also about going back using still using the camera as an extension of the body but also not divorcing it from like its bodily context like still going back to the body as being a source of um as a source of, of this meaning and as a source of the work as well yeah for sure and i even like in um like when i have more like formal writing for things i do cite my body as a place of research where i'm just like this is it's all like research, you know. Yeah. Um, so what's the, can, you know, just thinking about these two pieces in particular, North and True North. Well, one, I'm very interested in what the difference actually between them or the, 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 the concepts of North and True North are, uh, what, you know, what makes True North, True North, I suppose. But then also it feels like that is significant in a lot of your practice as well in terms of thinking about multiplicity and the function of multiplicity and repetition um can you talk a little bit yeah first about like kind of the differences between north and true north and then how these like these multiples these multiplications kind of show up in in your overall body of work mm -hmm. well the literal difference is 500 miles <laughs> which i actually didn't learn that until recently i knew it was 20 degrees but it whatever so that's it in miles um but really what it is is that i there's actually true north and magnetic north or i think the the appropriate terms and magnetic north is what a compass responds to when it's looking yeah. for north and true north I guess is 500 miles away but it's like if you were to maybe put an x right like on a map of like the most northern point that's what that's supposed to be so that's how I under understand it I could be you know um butchering that a little bit but what was most interesting to me was one that like why are there two like why is there a possibility there's two and it just felt like a trap to me because I think about like that when I associate what I associate with north right in terms of like, like for me it's like aspirational or even thinking back to like ancestral right it's like the direction of freedom or um yeah it's it's both aspirational and freedom and I feel like for there to be two possible for there to be like a moving target basically right or for there to be no true like direction or like landing spot for again i'll just use the word freedom right that was um it just felt like a trap which i think with the dualities and stuff too i always think about 
how how to sit with two things being true at once, mm -hmm. um, which is a very hard thing to do, right? But that's often the case. The case. <laughs> and I think just like it's very human to have trouble grappling with that, right? Um, but I like sitting in that space. Um, and I think also with the like, like particularly with like double using double exposures or things like that. Um, I'm also just interested in like perception or what we believe to be true. So again, it's kind of just going back to two things at once. Um, and even like what we what we think we know, which is something else I often refer back to is, um, you know, I grew up across from Central Park, but it wasn't until I was an adult where I learned about Seneca Village and like that it used to be a community of like affluent free, free black folks. And um, again, just like what you think you know about a place, right? Like I lived across the street, right? And didn't right. know for long, too long. Right. So what strikes me about um, all of your work, the photo collage, video work, um, is beyond kind of the immediate interest in landscape is the idea of manipulation. Um, and there's a history and a legacy, not only within landscape painting, but also landscape photography that presents this kind of seemingly untouched view of the wilderness or nature, um, this kind of objective viewpoint free of human entanglements, um, but not in the landscapes you present. Um, so I also, this was another example of the multiples, um, kind of multiplication in your work, but the what I really want to show is a brief clip from one of your longer video pieces um, called Drafts. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show this really quickly. Hopefully the sound is. Yep. <laughs> sound is subtle. Yeah, but it's important still.
So um, with that, you know, obviously with that video, we see, we see your actual hands come in, placing images onto the surface, the tearing, the repositioning, the cutting, the like making of edits, the making of juxtapositions, um, kind of the build, the layering, the buildings of meaning. We see you, you're, you're very involved throughout the entire process as kind of the artist creator, which feels very different than a lot of the ways we think about, you know, classic, um, classic landscape imagery, classic landscape photography, thinking of like Ansel Adams or classic landscape painting, you know, kind of the Turners or the Bierstadt's um, that present this kind of idea and this view of the landscape as the artist is kind of removed and it's this objective view, but you make it very clear to be present and your subjectivity being um, kind of purposeful. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and then also just kind of the use of image manipulation, I, not even necessarily in a digital context, but even in terms of literal, like mm -hmm. um, manipulating of the material and your role kind of in that, in, in meaning making within your work. Yeah, um, well, definitely in terms of like speaking back to traditional landscape photography, I, um, it's again, when I, it's funny because when I moved out here, I did think I was gonna make like, like nice landscape pictures or something. And it was just so dissatisfying. And I was just, and I, I realized that um, in my research, I also really started to think about, well, what was missing from those landscapes, right? What wasn't being seen there? So even like you talk about Ansel Adams, but I also often think about someone like Carlton Watkins who his images are responsible for Yosemite being a protected land, right? But those images being presented as if people weren't already occupying that space, right? And the land needed like saving or something like that. Um, but yeah, I was interested in like the relationship between, uh, between like who you expect to make those images, um, ownership or like, uh, authorship of those types of images. And I was also just like frustrated. <laughs> and so I think honestly with the tearing up, it's just like a real act of like that kind of, um, frustration, um, and wanting to like control the narrative maybe a little more or shift or shift it right or present a different type of narrative a draft right <laughs> um and yeah from like a process perspective i was also you know i made that in 20 i think i think it was 2016 um and it was when i soon after i arrived to to california and just grappling with everything i just mentioned and i was also interested just like in the material aspect of the photograph and wanting to kind of treat it more as an object. Um, and so, and I also was interested in collage, but I was like, couldn't glue anything down. I was like too afraid. It was like all these things that were just like being worked out in that piece, which I think, you know, I didn't know that that was going to be a piece, but it really is just documenting like my process. And I think um, generally that process for me is the most, important and interesting part of like making more so even than like the final object tends to be I'm just interested in like the workings of how you get to the place. Um, well, there's, there's a sense of like mastery that seems like it comes into you know like even as you're talking about like um, working through that frustration through the like tearing of it you know there's a certain respect or reverence you're supposed to have for the photographic objects and you know to, and not kind of not to attend to it as an object, but as an image, but like there's supposed to be a certain, you know, you touch it in specific corners and not at all and not on the surface. Mm -hmm. and the idea of kind of ignoring that um, and like having a mastery, like having a mastery over this like kind of master format in a certain way, like reinserting yourself within these histories, um, especially from histories that, you know, you know, the history of photography kind of coming up, um, the, with the, you know the or rather the establishment of photography the invention of photography kind of coming up around the same invention of like racial representation like those two being so deeply entwined and the idea of images being made of black people but black people not making being having the same access to make images and then what it mm -hmm. means to take for them for black image makers to take that same technology and that same format to um really subvert that kind of um, history, it feels like there's there's a lot there's a relationship between manipulation and power in this in this work. It feels like for me, and 
um, the idea of who has authority over, not only who has authority over the land and over the landscape, but also who has authority over visual representation. Um, and so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that also is like, how do you see power as being, uh, and systems of power as being kind of explored in and through your work? Yeah. Yeah, I all and I agree with everything you said, but <laughs> uh, great. Um, but yeah, no, I, I yes, um, you know, power is like an interesting word that I grapple with sometimes. I know that I, I do use it, um, and I think I'm more a more appropriate word maybe for me is thinking about like autonomy right which is related to power but just um i feel like there's more choice in that as opposed to like power but um yeah i yeah sorry i'm kind of like a little bit speechless because i feel like you said a lot of really great great things already that i feel like um are true well, it's like a timing and then also, I guess, authorship. Like, how do you see yourself kind of positioned? And not to say that it has to be like a battle between you and Carlton Watkins, you know, but like in a way, like, do you see yourself as yourself, not even just the works themselves, but like the work that you're doing, like your process, the whole, your whole approach to image making as being confrontational, I guess, with these, with these histories mm. and other sort of, um, do yeah. specifically white big white dude uh landscape artists i hope so but i will say that that's like not i feel like it's not fully my focus like i would hope that it is confrontational to that because all those things need to be confronted but i'm not my energy mm -hmm. is um dispersed a little differently where i feel like i am interested let's say like specifically actually just like you know land ownership in this country like is so tied to like again power right or or one's autonomy one's ability to um gain wealth um and that's more interesting to me when i think about you know earlier you showed the slide a test for 40 acres right just kind of like the loss of or that like never that land never being um, handed over in reparation, right? And then what are the long-term effects of that? Um, mm -hmm. And which, as we know from now, 1619 project, $6.4 trillion is like what, what that would have equal to today um, in terms of like wealth within a community. Um, so yeah, I mean, I definitely am like, I am definitely, my images don't look like traditional, you know, photographs, but I am really connected to that like history of photography and I am looking to um, like shift that narrative, but I just, you know, it's a tricky space where you don't always want to be talking back to the thing that's like, right. <laughs> that you, yeah, you guys gotta be talking to other things sometimes. Well, and it feels like with, you know, because so much of your process is additive, like there is like a talking back, but there's also that it's, I think to your point, if that isn't the primary focus, it feels like it's adding, it's it's creating something new. It's really opening, you know, literal holes in sort of the in object and the image itself. It's creating these portals, it's opening up these new possibilities mm -hmm. um, as a means of kind of foreclosing what's possible within. And I think that's kind of, I think that is often what the barrier is for people with, um, not only with uh, landscape photography or landscape, land, you know, quote unquote landscape, um, but also with uh, being in nature, being in wilderness itself is this idea, like to see it as, ex to go back to seeing it as expansive as opposed to like closed off to very specific people and very specific practices um, and, and owned really mm -hmm. like, and like owned by a specific person or I guess now in contemporary by a corporation um, or by, you know, a government um, seeing, yeah. going back to seeing it as being, as being open and um, there being possibility for a lot of different entry points for a lot of different people. Yeah. And I also just, you know, I just thought of a few artists I feel like do a really, I think do a good job at 
that like of a more direct kind of representation, which I think about, um, and I hope I'm not getting her name wrong, but I think her name is Naima Green, who did the, um, thank you, um, and Chanel Stone, who we both know and I talked about earlier, where I just think seeing a full body like in those spaces, right? A full black body in those spaces is so important. Um, and yeah, maybe they do a better job at that stuff, but <laughs> yeah, just wanted to shout them out because I just thought of those. No, I love that. Yeah, yeah please. Always interesting. Yeah, because I think, and it's interesting. To, so I think something that I notice, and it's, well, I guess this also speaks to kind of the survival question as well, but, um, and I think we talked about this, you and I actually one time before, but like, it felt like so much after like the 2016 election, I felt like I saw everywhere, all of these different, on the internet, all these different um, communities of black folks. And, and you're seeing it a lot now too, of talking about going back to the South or learning survival skills and this idea that like, you know, we got, we got to get ready, um, <laughs> for what, you know, for whatever's coming. And so it seems, it feels like there is kind of a lot of energy around seeing um kind of this return to like do these um ancestral knowledge systems this return to like um the american landscape this kind of reclaiming this heritage for for oneself yeah um, that has been denied you and sort of like almost like questioning why it's taken this long um yeah I, oh. There's, oh yeah no go ahead i'm just like bursting because you're saying so many crazy things but i was I, I definitely agree. And I also wanted to shout out this um, Leah Penniman who runs Soul Fire Farm in yeah. Albany, New York, who's like doing really excellent work right now. Um, and also has a whole like land reparations, like map and like project happening, which is exciting. Um, but, you know, there's also like, when you, when you say there is this resurgence, this reinterest happening, I think it's always really interesting when that's happening on like a huge collective scale. And I would even say it was probably even before the 2016 election um, where there's this woman, she goes by Afrovivalist and she's like this uh, survivalist who lives in like rural Oregon or whatever, but she, I'm trying, I want to take a workshop with her. I was trying to before COVID happened, but um she cites uh, Katrina as her moment of kind of like, oh, no one's going to like come get, like no one's gonna, yeah. So like, okay, I need to figure out how to do this on my own. And then also we just had Texas, right? And even like pe people in um, another parts of the South right now are without like water. And I'm just, it's just so clear that um, we are the ones who we have to care, right? No one else is going to, to show up. Um, yeah, but. I am also grateful for this shift, um, this like collective shift. And it's very different from like narratives I was surrounded with growing up, which not necessarily directly in my household, but I would just say like um, outside of that space, like thinking about, you know, nature as like dirty, literally, right? Or just mm -hmm. kind of like, why would you like get like, you know, just there's just things that were actually damaging, right? Or just like not true, but come from somewhere, come from a place, right? Like right. there, especially when you also just think about like my, our migration patterns, right? Of like black people in this country and why they had to move, right? Um, away from like more rural spaces, right? Um, right. And even the way, you know, the way migration happens, the way they move, I'm thinking about um, your colleague at Stanford, Jonathan Palm, and mm -hmm. the Green Book, and sort of, you know, it charts this kind of migratory pattern, but it also speaks to sort of the dangers that were implicit in moving through the landscape. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's in looking, I wouldn't say that's looking at, an, you know, it's, it's, you know, looking at transportation in a specific way, but it seems like even though the form take it takes different forms both of your work are kind of like thinking about very similar things like what it means to kind of be visible and exposed in this way um while also taking refuge in the land itself mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so i also want to show i want to show another clip of another work that you did um called untitled maps so i'm gonna play this really quickly and you don't, you know, it's a longer clip. So if you want to. Yeah.
so I'll just pause it there. But um, we can talk over it even. Oh yeah, the sound as well or something. Well, it'll just keep that's going. But, so um, so with so with this video, um, something that I think we've kind of started to circle around that I'm interested in is um, you know, it's I think this video is really interesting in sort of the kind of the serenity, the sort of placid kind of environment and the serenity, the, the sound that's almost overwhelmingly silent in a certain way, like as a kind of white noise, there feels like a stillness. But at the same time, as we're watching you kind of stack these, um, these rocks that continue to flip, like, you know, that are always bar like barely on the verge of completely falling apart, it feels like something that is present in a lot of your work is also this idea of precarity in the sense that, um, you know, every, all of this is very temporal and tenuous and, you know, subject to change. And as obviously, you know, we talked, you know, you talking a little bit about um, Katrina and then, you know, the most recent, uh, the storms in Texas and the flooding and people being without water and the wildfires and just sort of like thinking about the urgency of climate change and like climate crisis. And I think that's something that obviously is a conversation we all should be having, especially, I mean, we often are having it in California, but it also feels like something, like you can't make work about the land in this time without kind of attending to that, without attending to kind of like precarity. Um, and so I was just wondering if you could talk about that in not only this video, but also just in your work at large. Yeah, yeah. I that's a huge part of the things I think about. And I really appreciate that question because honestly, I don't get asked that very often. Really? Um, mm -mm. Um, yeah, I'll talk about that offline. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, you know, yeah, I think about that often. And when I first even started thinking about the survival skills, that's what I was thinking. Like that was the emergency I was thinking, like thinking about, right? Um, and my... I always was cared about that stuff, but obviously moving to California and dealing with fire season, definitely kind of like um, you can't ignore it or pretend it's not happening. Um, but in this video in particular, the backdrop, like the, the scenes that we see, that's actually one place where I am specific, which is uh, Princeville, North Carolina, which is a primarily black town that suffers from, um, I don't know if it's yearly, but it's very consistent flooding, right? Um, and actually this town was one of the first like um, townships like incorporated by like freed um, black people. So it's just, and then also then you again think about like who is at most risk from these like changes in the climate, right? Again, going back to the question of who's best positioned to survive a disaster like this or like Katrina or like Texas, um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I try to not be a pessimist, but I am. And <laughs> when you talk about the precarity of things, it's, I also just want to make it clear that it's like, where are the ones that are in the precarious position, right? Yeah. The land is, it will figure it out, yeah. right? Um, but it's us, right? And other like, you know, obviously like other animals are suffering under this as well, but also under our hand too. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. yeah, so how that we are was. being impacted, but we're also agents of this, mm -hmm. and the primary agents in, in, this deg in the degradation of yeah. the earth, which is interesting. this place that we need to survive, that we are actively, <laughs> actively killing. Yeah, I know, right? Mm. <laughs> Human story, I feel like, but, you know, I was... Yeah, I feel like it's something I forgot. Um, oh, just like the optimistic part, the part that tries to be optimistic is that, okay, we are agents for this, you know, for destroying where we live, but like, can we do the inverse, right? Can we be agents for like saving it or saving ourselves, right? Um, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I think it's interesting to think about you know, as you're saying, like the different popula populations who are more vulnerable than others, mm -hmm. um, and therefore, and like the idea of Afro survivalism, and you know, no one's coming to save us, and so we must, you know, figuring out ways to save ourselves, and that being also such a story of the Black American experience is sort of um, this constant, continual um, reworking and retooling um, to figure out how to how how we can save ourselves because no one is coming. 
and I mean, we're literally all here because some other people survived, right? Like, right. To go back to that. So there's also a really like uplifting, um, that's just like powerful to remember, you know, and it gives me, it's a part of my, the optimism. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, you know, even as we started this talk off by being like, you know, work doesn't right now does not have to respond in a specific moment, but there's no way to not kind of attend to the fact that you know, 500,000 people did not survive, but here we are like sitting on this Zoom call today talking about this work and sort of like what that's going to look like. You know, obviously I think it's, I, in, in a way, I think it's better to not have so much work right now that is directly attending to, um, to COVID to um, the past year, because we really won't know. I don't think we'll ever be, we won't be able to fully appreciate what the world is like again until we're further out until we've had like some distance and sort of see you know yeah who like who was a who made it out you know yeah like, and celebratory yeah. to have made it this far but like and not to mention though that throughout all of this up until very recently right it was in the hands of you know someone who was <laughs> did not care and was purposely trying to make it worse talking about our former right. president it's just like you know there's again in that like collective trauma of just like yeah how can we process we weren't even like it wasn't even acknowledged for so long right mm -hmm. while it was happening so i'm gonna stop my share now to see if there are any um questions um that have come in um and feel free for those of you who are watching on zoom or on you or not YouTube, Facebook, to drop questions in the chat. Um, but as we wait for any of those to come in, I also want to give um, give you a moment, Dion, to uh, plug any upcoming exhibitions or projects that you have. Um, if there's anything in progress that you want to share with us, um, it'd be great to to have you. Yeah. What, what do you have going on? I'm sure it's a lot. <laughs> it's an okay amount. I do. I am. Um... There is a show coming up at Round Weather Gallery, which is actually a fundraiser for um, climate organizations, actually um, local ones. So um, that opens later this month. I'm sorry, this exact date is escaping me, but um, Round Weather Gallery. Um, and I also will have a show in the fall um, at, at all, the at all space. Um, oh, cool. Uh, Chinatown or the mission? Not confirm. I have a hope for for the Chinatown location, but Ooh, why why do you have a hope for the Chinatown location? Because it's I mean, like a, location. it's like a bunker, and yeah. I just feel like thinking about again like survival and things like that. It's just like it it has that that energy that I would like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I mean, you know, I'm really excited to get my darkroom up and going. Yeah. What are, um, cause you were saying um, in the beginning that like, you, you know, without the dark room, this time period has been really focused on research. And I'm just wondering what, um, like what research topics you've been exploring during this time um, and where, where it's kind of leading you, what are things that you've been experimenting with? Um, yeah, I've been, uh, um, yes. I'll try and put this into words cause this is, yeah. I haven't really talked about it very much, but I, I am, Definitely still thinking about, you know, all the things we've talked about, but on top of that, really trying to understand how um, trauma functions within all of that. And again, we were just talking about, you know, the fact that collectively it's been a really traumatizing like year, four years, five years. Um, and more so thinking about how trauma shows up in like the land and in the body. Um, Specifically, I've been looking at poison oak a lot because it's a plant that's very common around here, but it really grows, it tends to grow or thrive along like just in disturbed land, particularly like from human disturbance. Um, and it's like, a, it functions as like a defense mechanism for the land. Also, we're the only ones who are like really allergic to it. Like- For real? Mm -hmm. Like other animals don't get- they're like I think like birds eat berries from it and stuff like it's like yeah. it's so there's, that to me is super interesting just in terms of like how that <laughs> like relationship is right or like when we go hiking and I see that along the trail edges it's always what I think of it's like you're literally telling us to stop right mm -hmm. um but yeah and then also just like how it trying to find a bridge the connection between like 
how it lives in the land and in the body and like how I don't know about like healing necessarily again this goes to like primarily pessimist but just like but just thinking and it's thinking that through and it's tied to some other personal experiences too around like trauma and survival right and just like what um that looks like but that's kind of a yeah. of words together that can describe what I've been yeah. about <laughs> Have you been interested at all in like travel and how um, like different, I mean, I know you were saying that like your work, and this is kind of intentional is that a lot of your work is really placeless is the idea that these same um, themes and these same concepts are kind of atten- are present um, in all of, in all land basically. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm wondering, I guess, in sort of the way that coming to the Bay Area open, opened up in certain ways, um, you're, you're thinking about these things, whether or not there's an interest in other parts of the United States or other parts of the world that um, you're curious about how this, how these things would change, how your perspective might change or open up. Um, yeah, yeah. For the past couple of years, actually, I've been really trying to get to the desert <laughs> as like as a landscape space and also thinking about like how, again, survival just in such like a barren, you know, arid space where we think of like, not being hospitable to life, right? There are lots of things that beings that thrive there and just I'm interested in in that emptiness too of, of those spaces. Um, yeah, the desert. Yeah. Trying to get there. It's curious. <laughs> I, I feel like I saw recently something, probably an infographic on Twitter or something to be honest, but um, about the idea how, that how in the next 20, 30 years, like, uh, the hottest place on earth in terms of like attraction to it is going to be the northernmost the northernmost states and the northernmost parts of of the globe um because the south will just be so inhab uninhabitable and like thinking about that in juxtaposition with you know specifically being here in the bay area and thinking about the elon musk of the world and sort of like gotta get to mars kind of like push the idea bad people yeah of, like, <laughs> moving not only north geographically but also physically north into into the solar system and that seems i don't know it again the pessimist kind of like you the pessimist to me it does not doesn't bode well i think but doesn't feel good no but <laughs> yeah i don't and yeah yes it's it sucks yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it just continues to be this place of aspiration yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah that yeah. doesn't really exist that's always yeah it's always moving yeah and yeah and it doesn't or it's at least I don't know if it doesn't exist but it's not fixed you know right right yeah yeah well this has been great uh thank you for um thank you for talking with me today um I'm always excited to see more of your work um I think it's really interesting I feel like we could have talked about any of these any number of these things for like another hour and a half um we won't I won't I won't yeah I won't force everyone to um change the schedules for that but um and you mentioned the things you have coming up um excited to learn more about your dark room when it's when it's available um do you plan on it yeah yeah I want to I want to come visit I want to see what's going on in the dark room um is there any do you want to leave us with any other last words or plugs before um we end for the day go outside take a walk that is good <laughs> um, the sun is coming out it looks like the rain is ending although it's kind of nice to walk around sometimes the rain too mm-hmm. um daylight savings this weekend i'm very excited about it we made it the light is returning um That'll be good but anyways i will see you around thank you so much Deanna. thanks elena thank you everybody, um, who's watching today um, if you um, if you know someone who didn't get a chance to catch um, today's talk, um, it'll be uploaded to our YouTube channel um, sometime in the next couple of days. Um, and stay tuned um, to and continue to follow Moad on our social media channels and our website to see um, all the different programs we have coming up in the next um, in the artist studio. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dion. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.